Welcome to the Wish I'd Known Men podcast, where we focus on how authors found success, looking at strategies that have taken them to the top of the bestseller charts, as well as what they've learned from their mistakes. Because being an indie author is more than knowing the latest marketing trend. It's about being innovative and creative and learning from your mistakes. Your co-hosts, Jamie Albright and Sarah Rosette, couldn't be more different. In fact, they're a study in contrasts. However, despite all of their differences, they agree that sharing what they wish they'd known, both the good and the bad, is the key to moving forward. Let's get to the show. Welcome to the Wish I'd Known Them podcast. I'm Sarah Rosette. And I'm Jamie Albright. And today we have Kevin J. Anderson on the show. And y'all, this is a big treat to have him on. He is just amazing. He's done so much. Yes, he's written in so many different genres, written so widely and has so much experience. He was very kind and shared a lot of his knowledge with us. And we talked about you know, kind of how he got into writing and talk about collaboration and hybrid publishing and um, reader expectations. Also, yes, yeah. lots of reader expectation stuff. And he also runs a master's degree program through uh, Western Colorado University. We'll talk about that. So if you're interested in getting a master's in publishing, um, he tells us about that and who's a good candidate for that. So it's a really yeah. good interview. Yeah, he also talks about professionalism, which, you know, you think would be a given, but sometimes we all need a little refresher on that, you know, just how That's to be true. as professional as possible. Yeah. yeah. So what's been going on with you? Um, I've had one of those weeks where, I don't know, I've been handling everything really well, you know, all the COVID stuff. Mm-hmm. And I think part of it was because I was in my routine and my routine didn't change that much. Mm-hmm. But I don't know, earlier this week, I just had a couple of days where I was just kind of in a funk and it was hard to getting things done. I was kind of stuck on the book. That might be part of it. Yeah. I got some more words down and pressing on and, yeah. you know, just one of those kind of bleh weeks. Yeah, me too. In fact, I post, I did a video, you know, I worked out my, I did therapy on Facebook <laughs> as you should, you know, let's all do it. Oh my gosh. But I just, it was just one of those days. Like I was just done with all of this. i had a little run in with my sisters. I have four sisters and I love them very much, but we had had a little chat and I didn't like it. And uh, then I, but mostly I'd gotten news that the beginning of my book needed to be re- reworked uh, from the editor. And mm-hmm. it was just, it was just kind of overwhelming everything, you know, the COVID, mm-hmm. my sisters, you know, and then that I was just like, I'm done stick a fork in me uh, because I was just done, but I'm better now. I worked out the beginning of my book. My sisters and I are all good. Um, Yeah. So it's, it all worked out. Yeah. It's just been one of those weeks. So just got to keep going and and we will all get through this and we'll all get back to our new normal. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. (laughs) That's all I can say about it. I I decided I must stay off Facebook more because I just can't handle the uh, the paranoia, the anxiety, and the judginess. Mm-hmm. I just, because oh, I want everybody to be happy and get along. Let's just all get along. <laughs> Sing kumbaya. And, just, and world peace. That's all we ask. Yeah. <laughs> I really want world peace. Um, yeah. So it's been kind of crazy. My book is still right now coming out June the 18th. So, um it's still, I think I still will have a few things to do when I get it back from my editor, but right now, fingers crossed, it's coming out June 18th and I'm very happy about that. Yeah. So that's good. Yeah. yeah. And so even though you had the setback, you yeah. got it fixed and it's yeah. going to be, it's going to be better. Yeah. All right. Don't you feel better about it? It is going to be better. Yeah. Yeah. And the exciting thing is uh, it's on the most anticipated reads for 2020 mm. uh, romance reads for 2020 on, on good nice. night. So that's fun. Yeah. And, uh, you know, my readers have been voting and stuff, so that's been fun, but I'm just ready to, I'm ready to get the cover out so people can see it. They're going to love it. And yeah, it's all yeah. that stuff. But yeah. Well, anyway. good. yeah. well, and we should also mention that uh, when this goes out, um, the stay home story summit, is still going on. Mm-hmm. And if you're interested in videos on craft and 
uh, promotion and things like that from all different sorts of experts. Uh, you can sign up for free. It's all included and there's no upsell. So we'll put a link to that in the show notes. You can see Sarah and I in our finest, uh, in, in our video. In, in color. Yeah. We actually <laughs> got dressed and put on some makeup for that day. So yeah, that's right. So. Yeah. All right. Well, let's get on to the interview. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Well, today we're really excited to have Kevin J. Anderson with us today. Hello and welcome. Hi, great to be on this morning. Good and to have you. Here. I'm on my first yeah. cup of coffee, and and uh, the cats are still settling settling down for the day's uh, the morning work day. So we'll we'll answer is, some questions and get all warmed up for the day. Yeah, yeah this is great. Exactly. So so can you start us off and just tell us a little bit about the genres you write in? Um, I know you've got a pretty extensive catalog, so we let you give us the overview. Well, I don't I don't like to get stale because I write all the time and I I like to read in a lot of different genres so mm-hmm. I like to write in a lot of different genres uh, my my main thing is science fiction I write big epic science fiction like the expanse or or uh, you know, big, big I've written for Star Wars I've written for dune I've written all kinds of uh, big science fiction and that's kind of my first love but very very close second is uh, epic fantasy like Game of Thrones and and I'm right right now finishing the third book in a big epic trilogy that started with a book called Spine of the Dragon that came out last year. And so I'm in the middle of, of uh, choreographing the 95 storylines and 100 characters that I need to wrap up after three books and, and killing people right and left and having great battles and, and all that <laughs> stuff. So that's, that's what I'm working on. But I've also, um, I've written for the X-Files and I've worked on a lot of uh, dark fantasy and horror and thrillers. And, and I enjoy those too. And in mm-hmm. fact, I just, uh, I had a really cool serial killer vampire thing that just came out in the UK and it's going to be in the U S in August, uh, assuming the world doesn't fall apart further, but that's kind yeah. of the dates right now. Uh, and that's called steak and it's a serial killer who believes in vampires. And so he's murdering people who have night jobs and are never seen in the daylight because he's convinced they're vampires. Mm-hmm. And, I play a neat game all the way through the book as to the, the reader. You don't know whether vampires are real or not. So you don't know if this guy is just a nutcase or if he's a hero saving, saving people by killing vampires. And, and um, so that one came out and I just, you know, I write whatever interests me. I've written a bunch of comedy stuff and, and nonfiction and writing instruction books and, mm-hmm. and just kind of like this, the, the jerky guy who's got the TV controls on the sofa and just <laughs> channels over and over again. Well, I staked. I mean, what a great title for a vampire serial killer book. I just, that sounds so interesting to me. Uh, I'm, I read in every genre. And so, uh, yeah, that's something I'm going to check out when it comes well, out. And I think you learn from it because mm-hmm. in writing my big science fiction, I, uh, one of my mentors early on was Dean Koontz. Mm-hmm. And I would read all of Dean Koontz's books and, and I just loved the way he would do his suspense scenes and he would just amp everything up and really make the suspense scene go. And I was at the time I was studying Dean Koontz books and I was writing this a big uh, hard science fiction novel, but there was a bunch of suspense, you know, tension scenes in the science fiction novel. And so I learned from Dean Koontz's horror novels about how to do suspense in my science fiction novel. Right, right. And that's why you should read outside the genre. Cause yeah. if, if all you read is quest fantasy and all you write is quest fantasy, you're just going to be doing like leftovers every day yeah. instead. It's kind of stale. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So tell us what your first big success was. Well, um, my first novel was published in 1988. It's a, hard science fiction, gothic horror murder mystery called resurrection Inc. And, mm-hmm. and, uh, that was, inspired by an album by the rock group Rush. So I'm just this little 25 year old guy writing a science fiction book. And, and I got it published by Signet Books as a uh, paperback novel and had a horrible cover on it. And I was the proudest person in the world. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, But this is like a midless science fiction paperback. I, I think I worked a year on it and I got paid $4,000 and I never even earned the advance back. But, Mm. but I put in the acknowledgements that it was, uh, inspired by this rush album and I signed copies and mailed it off to the band's management company. And I got a letter back from Neil Peart, the the drummer from rush and the guy who writes all their lyrics. And, and so he and I started a correspondence since 
like 1989 or something like that. And um, that went on for a long time. We wrote a short story together and then uh, he wrote an introduction to one of my story collections. And then he and I wrote uh, a Rush's last album that they released was called Clockwork Angels. It's a big concept album. And Neil asked me to write the novel of that concept album with him. So I've got the first, it was a New York Times bestseller when it came out. Um, and so I wrote the novel version of the last Rush album, which was really cool. Mm. Now, in parallel with that, um, you'll you'll discover during this podcast that I don't just tend to work on one thing at a time and, and finish mm -hmm. it. Uh, I also publish like four other just regular science fiction or fantasy novels. And uh, I got noticed by Lucasfilm, and they approached me and asked if I would write uh, some sequels to Star Wars for them. So I jumped at that, and I wrote uh, three sequels to Star Wars, and they liked what I did, and they ended up asking me to do a total of 54 projects from comic wow, to, that's you know, adult awesome. books to pop-up books to everything. And then based on that, I... Um, uh, Chris Carter, the creator of the X-Files, um, had read some of my Star Wars books. And I got a call from his office from people saying, uh, Chris Carter likes your Star Wars books. Would you write X-Files books for us? And so I wrote three X-Files novels. One of them was a, a number one international bestseller. So that, that worked out pretty well. And then I did yeah. comic books and short stories for them. And, and kind of based on all this stuff coming together, uh, my favorite science fiction book of all time was Dune by Frank Herbert. Mm -hmm. And Frank Herbert wrote six Dune books before he um, he passed away of pancreatic cancer in, I should know this off the top of my head, like 85 or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but he left his story just on a cliffhanger. It wasn't done. It was like everybody's in the middle of, of something. And I waited about 10 or 12 years and in the meantime, I had published a bunch of books. I'd been on the Nebula Awards ballot, and I had all these bestsellers, and I had Star Wars books and X-Files books. And I kept waiting for uh, Frank Herbert's son, Brian, to finish the last Dune book because I was a fanboy. I wanted to know how the story ended. <laughs> and uh, it just wasn't coming. And finally, through a mutual friend, I, I wrote him a letter to ask if he was ever going to finish the story. And if he wasn't, could we maybe, like, look at it together and collaborate mm -hmm. on something. And, and he and I became great friends and we uh, wrote uh, a big proposal for a, a prequel trilogy to Dune. And that sold to uh, Bantam Books as the largest single science fiction contract in publishing history. Mm -hmm. And we've since done 15 Dune books. And now there's a big budget legendary film of Dune that's, it's all filmed and it's going to be coming out well, supposedly in December, who, who knows what's happening. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, and then that's got uh, graphic novels spun off that we're working on and a TV show. And so I, I don't know what to point to when you say <laughs> my, my first big success, because I'm doing all this stuff at the same time. But yeah, uh, I do want to kind of spin it backward though, because before all that, I, um, I've got like 800 rejection slips. I mean, I've, I'm submitting and submitting and writing and writing. And I even have a trophy that says the writer with no future because I can <laughs> more rejection slips by weight than any other person at a whole writing conference. So it's not, I, I, it's a disservice to just say, oh yeah, I wrote stuff and it became a huge success the first time right. I did it. I mean, it right. was, I had 80 rejection slips before my first short story was published anywhere. So it's, um, yeah. It's not all, all up all the time. So, and that's yeah. kind of one reason we wanted to do the podcast was to kind of contrast the really successful things with the things we've learned. So, so you've written so widely and in so many different genres. Looking back, um, is there anything that you wish you had known about writing or craft when you got started? If you could help somebody out now, what would you recommend? Yeah. Well, there's. It, it, I saw the title of your podcast, and it's funny because one of the one of the talks that I've given at libraries and writers conferences at science fiction conventions, um, I mean, I've no exaggeration. I've probably given it 150 times. And the title of the talk is things I wish I'd known when I was just starting out uh, yeah. or, or things I wish some pro had told me when, when I was just starting out. And it's not, I would not really focus on the craft part of it because the craft you as a writer, you can figure out how to learn the craft, and and a lot of it is innate talent. I mean, there are good writers, and there are bad writers, and you can you can learn things. But if you have no talent at all, you can't 
<laughs> you yeah. can't learn it. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the most important thing for new writers to learn is professionalism, that you need to um, interact well with other editors, with other publishers, that you need to be uh, reliable, you need to be courteous, you need to um, be a person that somebody wants to work with. Mm -hmm. Because if there's, and we're looking at traditional publishing now, but if there's like a big editor at, at uh, HarperCollins Books and you interact with them and you're just a total jerk, well, they're not going to have very much patience, no matter how brilliant you are. If you're too mm -hmm. much trouble to work with, you get thrown by the wayside because there's 500 other authors right behind you that's waiting to, to fill that mm -hmm. slot. Right. Um, way back uh, when we were talking with, I think she was the editor of Berkeley Books at the time, we were having drinks at a convention. Remember back when you could actually like face-to-face -face interact <laughs> with people? Um, we were having drinks in the convention and, and uh, my wife and I were talking to this editor and she was, one of her authors had just done this, this fundamentally stupid thing. I can't remember what it was, but it was the, the, the author had sent like the only copy of the manuscript. This was back before when they were actually typewritten. So it sent the only copy of the manuscript and the mail lost it. So now this whole book was gone. Um, and she's like railing about how could authors be so stupid? And then the same author had been uh, like a nightmare doing contract negotiations because they didn't understand um, you know, basic contract provisions. And she was just moaning about how this, how come this author doesn't know anything about the business? And I said, so um, you deal with lots of authors. How many of them do you think actually know the business? How many read Publishers Weekly every week? How many understand right. copyright? How many know what their contracts say? How many? And it just kind of like stopped her in her tracks. And she looked up at me and, and looked at my wife and she said, well, you and Rebecca do. And, and then she like named two other authors. And then she was stumped about any other mm -hmm. author that she thought knew the business. Mm -hmm. um, this is your business. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it's like a doctor not reading medical journals. You want, mm -hmm. you want to understand how indie publishing works, how nutritional mm -hmm. publishing works, how contracts work. I mean, when you read a contract, you should know what you're agreeing to. Mm -hmm. um, and you should know what's negotiable and what's not. I mean, there's a, there's a warranty clause that says, yes, I wrote this and no, I didn't steal it. Mm -hmm. um, that part's not negotiable. You have to warrant that you really wrote it. But there are all kinds, like how many contributors copies you get or, or how much time they have exclusive rights to your, say you write a short story and they publish it in an anthology or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. um, you can usually negotiate whether you want your rights back in six months or they'll ask for two years and you ask for two months and then you end up in six months or something like that. Um, you just, that's the thing that I wish I would tell most aspiring writers. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, a, it's a perfect segue I'll spin off because 12 years ago, um, uh, Rebecca and I, as well as Brandon Sanderson, David Farland, and Eric Flint, uh, we were meeting together ourselves to be talking about uh, what we had learned and opportunities and how to negotiate this contracts. And, and basically, when you're a successful author, there's not that many people you can complain to. So we, we got, got together and we're talking professional stuff and we decided to form something called uh, superstars writing seminars because there, there were so many writing seminars that were about, you know, craft and how to do world building and set scenes and create characters. But there were no writing seminars that talked about the business side of it. I mean, what, how do you read a royalty statement and what does copyright law mean and, and what is fair use and, and how, what do the contract terms mean? So we, we formed our own uh, little, we held it in, in Pasadena, California. And we had, I think, 67 attendees the first year. And we are now uh, halfway through ramping up to our 12th year in Colorado Springs wow. and uh, I think we've already got 250 people signed up for next year. And it's just, it, it's one of the best things that we've done, I think, is just kind mm -hmm. of paying it forward about how how to be professional, how to interact with people, how to, um, how to be somebody that other writers, editors, publishers want to work with. Right. And, you know, just sort of up, upping, the, uh, upping the game for everybody across the board. Right. And I think that's true whether you're traditionally published or indie published. And maybe 
in some ways even more important is indie published because you're dealing directly with other authors. I mean, I know that there's this whole professional agents and stuff with traditional publishers, but sometimes there's a buffer. If you have an agent, they can buffer your bad behavior or your attitude from somebody else. But when you're an indie, you're, you're in each other's faces and you really have to learn to be a good community member. I talk about that all the time. And so, yeah, I think that's great advice. Well, and it's, I mean, as indies, you're, you're required to be, social media interacting and build your newsletter. I mean, right. if you've got your newsletter list and you post some bombastic, horrific, divisive, yeah. racist, something in your newsletter, poof, there goes all your readers. And right, exactly. this isn't like, like um, in the old days when all of your books were sold at Barnes and Noble and borders and all these books. And, and the author was some, you know, shadowy figure like mm-hmm. Bambi's father in the forest someplace mm-hmm. as an indie it's, it's you face to face with your readers. I mean, you've got to build up your own readers and you need to learn how like the care and feeding of your readership, you've got to yes. treat them well. I love that term care and feeding. That's really great. <laughs> so uh, what assumptions did you make at the beginning of your career and looking back, did they turn out to be right or wrong? <laughs> I made a couple of wrong assumptions that, that, uh, <laughs> First, I thought that once you got anything published, you had it made and you were re- yeah. incredibly wealthy. I mean, I sold, uh, I was working full time at, at this government research laboratory. I was a technical writer. Uh, I was writing like chemical protective clothing manuals and respirator <laughs> safety guides and page turners. Yes, <laughs> but I was writing and I was making a living at it. Yeah. So I was doing that and, you know, going home and, and working on my first novel at night and, and after about a year, I got it published, and and uh, and I sold it to Signet Books. That was Stephen King's publisher. That's a mm-hmm. major publisher, and I just went, "Wow, I got it made!" And no, I got four thousand dollars for it for a year. <laughs> and everybody that I worked with thought I was just going to quit any minute now because I was a millionaire because I had sold a paperback book to to Signet. Right. Um, the other thing that because. I've wanted to be a writer since I was a little kid. I mean, since Mm -hmm. forever. And so I was always reading uh, in science fiction. There's this magazine called Locus, which is sort of like the news magazine of science fiction. So Mm -hmm. I I got to be reading all of the, like who sold what book and who's the editor at Ace Books and who's the new publicist at Bantam. And so I like knew all these names and they were like gods on Olympus to me. They were like (laughs) these figures that that they were the captains of industry they they were the the publishers of major book lines that I was reading and I aspired to be um, you know in among that crowd I wanted to be with them because these were the guys that ran publishing that they knew the whole industry mm-hmm. and the real shocker for me was that once um, once I got into the industry and remember I've been studying this stuff. I wanted to know how contracts work. I wanted to know how, how book distribution was and how does a bookstore work? Because it was, it was relevant to my earning a living. Mm -hmm. And then when I got into it and I started to know all these people and working with them, I would like, wait a second, you don't know what you're talking about. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, that the, the really amazing thing was, um, once we got to be big enough authors that we had our own publicist at the publishing company that here you go, here's your assigned publicist for your star Wars book that's coming out mm-hmm. or whatever. Um, and remember I've, I've always been focused on marketing and publicity. And I mean, I was mailing out a paper newsletter since like 1993 or something. Oh man, that's amazing. Yeah. And, and you know, this is, I understood this and then they were assigning me publicists that that were just wrong. Mm-hmm. I mean, they go like I had one person, and you're just going to love this. I had I don't want to tell you what publisher it was, but I had a new a big new book coming out, and they thought it would be a great idea if I tweeted one sentence at a time the first two chapters of my novel. Oh gosh. They wanted me to spend all day, one sentence at a time, one tweet uh, at a time. That would have been probably like a thousand tweets. Yeah, yeah. And they said, that's a great idea. And I said, no, every mm-hmm. one of my followers is just going to disappear if I do that. Yeah. And and they were upset. They thought this was a great idea. 
And I mean, I hope you agree. If you are on a Twitter feed and somebody's sending you a thousand tweets, one sentence at a time of their, their chapter, who wants to read that? Nobody no. wants to read that. No. Well, no, and because of the way it goes, you can't keep it would up. Be back- no, it would be backwards. It would be backwards. Really. Yeah, exactly. And, and they just, they were, they, they were kind of, many times I sort of got this little pat on the head, like, there, there, dear author, let us do what we know what, how, to, how to do right. it. Right. And that was the real shocker for me was that I went, no, you, you don't know what you're doing. This is, I know more than you do with this. Right. And uh, no, I did not back down and I did not tweet my entire first chapter once. <laughs> That's great. That's been, that was my experience too. Is there was a lot of things. I had a lot of suggestions. I was like, Oh, these are, this is great marketing ideas. And a lot of them were from indie things that were going on and they were just not interested. And uh, so, yeah. They're a little slower to react. And and, and I'm diehard uh, hybrid. I mean, i am still got a bunch of books coming out from New York publishers. I'm still publishing a, a bunch of our own things. And I'm trying to cross over what I've learned from, from both sides. And we had, um, and I'm, I'm kind of proud of this. I don't know if you you talk about Brian Meeks or his, uh, mm-hmm. his yeah. philosophies of cover copy and stuff. Yeah. Well, I know Brian and, and I've, I've read his stuff and he's coached me on and basically how to write his little, the little punchy, you know, yeah. Cop- points, yeah, those little blurbs, so very, yeah. very quick little things, mm-hmm. uh, which is how you get it when you're reading on an Amazon ad. Mm-hmm. And um, I've got Bantam right now is re issuing our first Dune trilogy, which originally came out in 1997 or something like that. Mm -hmm. And because it came out in 1997, the cover copy was like five big, long paragraphs, big describing everything and the whole background and blah, blah, blah. Um, And they're reissuing it. And they said, should we just use the same cover copy? And I said, you know, it's maybe time for a facelift. And and they said, well, what do you want to do? And they were going to like rewrite it or polish mm-hmm. it a little bit. And I said, let, let me do something different with it. And so I, I rewrote it the, the Brian Meeks way. Like, like um, you know, this is a prequel to Dune. So I, I, mm-hmm. I, I'm off the top of my head. It was like, like before Paul Atreides led a galactic revolution, before the planetologist was on the desert planet Dune, there was Dune House Atreides. And I just did one, but the, it's the story of the emperor overthrowing his father. It's the story of the Baron Harkonnen uh, in his first battles with the Duke Leto Atreides. It's the story. I did these quick little, um, trust me, it's much better the way I, <laughs> it, but, um, but, but I just really did the, the punchy movie trailer kind of thing. Yeah. And I sent it in and, and it caused, quite an uproar over there. I mean, I got these calls from the editor and she said, our publicity department's loving this and our publisher's loving this and all, this is great. So I, I redid it. And then, and so then I, I sent them Brian Meeks, his book. I said, here's the whole philosophy of it. And in fact, Brian would love to like be a consultant for you and teach you guys how to write cover copy. Yeah. And they said, now we're okay. Thanks. Yeah, exactly. And that book is Mastering Amazon Descriptions by Brian yeah. Meeks. So we'll put those that in the show notes. But, uh, yeah, I did a workshop with – well, Brian and I, we've known each other for – since 2016, I guess, at the Smart Artist where Sarah and I met. And um, But I did a workshop with him. And, yeah, people in the audience, I knew because I – I know Brian, I know that's what he does and he's so good at it, but people in the audience, I mean, their heads were exploding as he was doing these description things. And it was just awesome to watch that. And it, they work. They're just amazing. Yeah. No, so. no. Some of it I think is like too stripped down and too, yeah. too and, but I've, well, I've even argued, works. I've even argued with him and he just says, well, I don't care. I could guarantee you that this way works. And he just <laughs> does the AB stuff and shows me and, and, He's right. I yeah. just kind of dig my heels in sometimes, <laughs> but that's the way it that's works. Funny. That funny. Well, that's a good transition to our next question. Yeah. Um, have you ever made a mistake that turned out to be a good thing? Uh, you know, I've made lots of mistakes and I look at them as learning experiences. Exactly. You know? yeah. um, right. And what, because I started out early I mean, I, I was 12 years old when I got my first short story. Uh, wow. I sold my first short <laughs> story for $12 and 50 cents. I mean, I, I was, I was sending things around since I was 11, I think, you know, just sending it out. And 
uh, one one of the big mistakes that I made is that when you're 15, 16, and I'm really getting into the industry, I joined a whole bunch of writers' organizations and and became very active because I thought that was how you how you became an important writer by you know joining all these organizations and mm-hmm. and I ended up being like the grievance officer and the vice president and then I ended up being the president and and then you get um, you know you watch you watch the news you watch Fox and MSNBC and you see the whole terrible political infighting and all that well exactly the same thing happens in the most pathetically trivial writers organizations and there's all these arguments all these fighting that the flame wars and I back when it was genie I mean this the the online genie service where there was these constant like science fiction arguments and flame wars all over the place and it was just horrific and the thing that turned out to be good was I dove into all that and I really got involved in everything and I burned out on all of it before my career was significant enough that it could have damaged my career. Mm, uh, yeah, so I got good. that out. I got that out of my system and I realized, you know what? I no, I'm, I'm not going to run for the president of the science fiction writers of America. And I'm yeah. not going to run for the author's guild and I'm not going to get involved in that. <laughs> That's not to say that these organizations don't do good, but, but they're a giant time sink. And mm-hmm. the, uh, I, I really learned about um, posting anything like political on your social media because um, my, I, I certainly have opinions. And if you sit next to me and have a beer, we can talk about them. But I'm just not going to post anything on my social media mm-hmm. stuff other than uh, – I mean, it, and it upsets me a little bit sometimes because I feel so passionately about certain things that I just really want to – um, and I've got, if you add up all of my Facebook pages and Twitter and, and my newsletter list, I think I'm at like 36,000 people or so. Mm-hmm. And so if I like insist on, um, save the whales or something mm-hmm. like that, I could reach a lot of people, but that's just not my brand. That's not who I am. I'm, I've got mm-hmm. readers from all over the, the perspective and uh, people yeah. who, who think I agree with them, even though I really, really disagree with them. <laughs> but we just don't get into that. That's yeah. right. Sarah and I feel the exact same way. Yeah. You know, I always feel like people are following me to find out about my books and bookish things. They don't really care what I think about politics and stuff. And I've had that experience following other writers. When they go off on politics, I'm like, that's not really why I'm interested in you. Yeah, <laughs> so or- I always feel it's better just to keep it to myself. Mm-hmm. Or have a different platform under a different persona or whatever if yeah. you want to do that. Well, but yeah. the other thing is, and I did that for before it got so bad, I kind of did a, like on, on Sundays on Facebook, I would throw, um, we would have some sort of political discussion. Mm-hmm. I would mm-hmm. put something out there about um, something in the news or whatever. And it, 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 it was okay. I mean, because my people were well enough behaved and I was a, a stern guy. I just said, no, if you're going to be, I'm going to just block you if you're going to be nasty about it. But even when it was okay, it sucked up all my time because that was like, I spent all Sunday doing this political argument and no writing. And refereeing uh, probably. And refereeing. Yeah. And I would get emotionally upset about it and, and you know, it yeah. just wasn't worth it. Anymore. Yeah. Well, uh, so the opposite to that, have you ever had an idea that you thought this is it, this is brilliant, and then it turned out to be not so great? Well, I've had some some ideas for books that I, I wrote that I just mm-hmm. thought this is an instant bestseller. <laughs> and um, now in in traditional publishing, and you're right most of the time, in traditional mm-hmm. publishing, you can say, well, they just screwed it up. Mm-hmm. And they, they did screw it up in many times. Um, I wrote a book uh, called Captain Nemo, which was the life story of Captain Nemo from Jules Verne, the guy who mm-hmm. who uh, invented the Nautilus. And I, I spent two years writing this book. I reread all of the Jules Verne novels. I researched all the French history. So this is the story of this. It, it's young Jules Verne and his fictional friend, mm-hmm. uh, Andre Nemo. And Jules Verne famously wrote all these books and never left his uh, 
he never left France. I mean, he just, he just didn't travel. He didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. yeah. He would read books and he'd write all these adventures. And so in my novel, his friend Nemo goes aboard, stows away aboard a ship and he fights pirates and he gets shipwrecked on a mm -hmm. mysterious island and finds a cave that takes him to the center of the earth. And, and he, uh, gets a balloon and he goes five weeks across Africa in a balloon. And then he gets, um, imprisoned by uh, uh, this caliph in the Crimean war and he's forced to build a submarine boat and he goes off and, and everything from Jules Verne. And I just absolutely loved this book and it came out so perfectly and my agent loved it. And, and this is at a time when I had 10 million books in print and probably 35 bestsellers and, and he sent it around and, and nobody got it. Just, mm -hmm. it just nobody got it that, mm -hmm. that went, publisher to publisher to publisher and they just kept saying well if they want to read this why don't they just read the old Jules Verne novels from 1850 <laughs> um, uh, and because it starts out when the two of them are are boys mm -hmm. and then I mean it's their life story they start out as a boy they're friends and then they they break up and then they go have adventures and things so then these people were like well is this a young adult book but they grow up in it so how is that and <laughs> and I said, well, it's a family book. Everybody can read it. It's mom and dad and kids. Everybody can read this book. And they go, well, there's no market for that. Uh, and, and so it, it came out. It, it did okay. I mean, I think mm -hmm. it gradually earned its advance back. But I expected this to be, you know, a movie, this huge yeah. hit, a big bestseller. And, and uh, no, and then that went out of print and I sold it reprint rights to another publisher. And mm -hmm. they had it out for a few years. And then that's just gone out of print. And now I've got the rights back and, and we at my own press, Wordfire Press, mm -hmm. we just re-released it as a, a trade paperback, a hardcover, an audiobook, uh, I mean, everything. So um, who knows? But that yeah. was one of those where I just thought when I got the idea for this book, I, I, I think I was in the in the bathtub. I was like sitting there reading it. I just like sat up and went, holy cow, this is the best idea ever. And <laughs> Well, I, I, the people still love that book and I love the book, but, uh, I, I don't sometimes know. I sure missed it. Get, yeah. It's sometimes it's hard to get the people in charge to catch your, uh, catch your vision for something. And that's, I think that is what, um, some writers find frustrating about traditional publishers or agents or whatever, because it's just hard. I mean, we should be able to communicate our ideas and we do, they just can't grab them and, well, and hold them back, like we want them to. Yeah. That, that gets back to what I was starting to say though, that back in traditional publishing days, you could always blame the publisher for screwing it up. Yeah. Now, if you're an indie author and you're your own publisher and your publisher doesn't get your vision for the book, you're kind of in a bad shape. Yeah. There's no yeah. one else to blame but yourself. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's turn a little bit and talk about um, some of the things you're involved in now. Um, so you, you mentored a lot of writers through the Superstars Writing Seminar. You've already mentioned the seminar. So um, tell us how that's impacted you, the running the, the seminar and mentoring people. Well, I mean, there's, there's something about paying it forward. And that's just something that um, after you've I mean, I like helping people. I, I like uh, one of my um, one of my phrases that I've often said is, "I've already made the mistake, so you don't have to make them." Mm -hmm. uh, and it's I had a lot of um, mentors who helped me out when I was starting as a writer, and I learned so much from them. And and just you know, one one letter from Dean Koontz could have saved, probably did save me like a year's worth of wandering around and trying to figure it out myself. Right. And uh, I, I like the feedback that I get. I like knowing that I've got, you know, hundreds of these little Padawans out there who are going to become <laughs> Jedi Knights and stuff <laughs> for everything. Uh, and the, uh, the payback that you get, I mean, just the support that I get whenever I need something and, and the, the support safety net that I get. And, uh, you know, I, I feel really good about that. And, you know, that, that's something once you've reached a certain level of success, it, it kind of behooves you to uh, not just hoard it all yourself. You should be helping uh, somebody else and, and uh, teaching them things. And now not everybody's a good teacher. I mean, that not, mm -hmm. um, that, that's not something that you have to be 
as a teacher, but you should still be able to offer your advice or, or um, like, no, you can't do that. Don't, don't just, I mean, I had somebody who was writing a, um, a writing book about setting scenes in a fantasy universe or something like that. And he was publishing this book that, that he decided the best way to do it was to take all sorts of screenshots from the Lord of the Rings movies and put them all over through his book. And I said, um, no. And he says, no, it's fair use. I said, no, it's not fair use. And yeah. he said, well, I thought it was. <laughs> well, I, kind of, I hope I saved him from a little bit of uh, stuff like that. Legal trouble. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and people were like, you know, I'm just going to write my own star Wars novel and publish it and sell it. And people will buy it. No, you can't do that either. And, yeah. and, hope that you've saved them a little bit of grief. So. Right, exactly. So you're also um, the director of the graduate program in publishing at Western Colorado University. What have you learned about being a, the director of this program? I mean, from being right. the director of this So we're, we're just finishing up our first year. I, I got hired to basically create from scratch a master's degree in publishing. That's amazing. Uh, at that Western Colorado University was all... Um, Look, I'll be I'll be frank. I I got a bachelor's degree and graduated, then got a job, and I published a bunch of books, and yeah. and I I was not really in the academic circle. So uh, when they when they approached me, I thought, well, do I really want to go to college and and teach iambic pentameter and all that kind of stuff? <laughs> but uh, Western Colorado University has a their graduate program in creative writing. They've got you can get a degree, a master's degree, an MFA in genre fiction writing, which I thought, wow. oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, and they've got cool. a degree in screenwriting, and they've also got uh, a degree in nature writing and poetry. And and um, so it's the fact that they offer a degree in genre fiction mm-hmm. made me think, okay, these are kind of practical and cool people. And mm-hmm. and I've, I've, I'm aware of the program, kind of sat in on some of the classes, and, and I think, look, if I was starting out, I would have loved that genre fiction Oh yeah. I mean they they make you write romances and westerns and mysteries and thrillers <laughs> and science fiction and fantasy and and dig into the tropes of all those and how to build them up. So that's that's really cool, but they they had a publishing program ages ago but it had kind of fallen by the wayside cuz they didn't have anybody to teach it and mm-hmm. and they they came to me because I've been very successful in traditional publishing but also very successful in indie publishing. And Basically, they gave me carte blanche to create my whole program. It's an MA. It's a one-year-long program, and I, it's two courses. I Well, it's a bunch of courses, but it's evenly split between traditional and indie. And we teach them you know, copyright and contracts and marketing and publicity and book design and typography and, and um, uh, releasing books and bookstore distribution and, and everything. And, and the... Uh, it's it's hands-on practical stuff like they're uh, through draft to digital they gave us uh, some money that we could fund uh, their their student group project is that they produce and edit and release an anthology an original anthology that they came up with and so last last summers when they started when we had two weeks Mm-hmm. The whole thing is online, but it's two weeks in person in the summer in the Colorado mountains. Mm-hmm. Although this year it's not going to be in person. In yeah. the Colorado mountains. It's all going to be virtual <laughs> stuff. Um, so they brainstormed an anthology. They came up with the idea called monsters, movies, and mayhem sort of uh, horror, science fiction, fantasy stories mm-hmm. about movies and movie monsters and everything else. And they had, uh, they could pay six cents a word cause that's the money that draft digital gave us. They solicited the stories. They got 435 submissions. They had to read the slush pile. They had to write the rejections. They had to choose the stories that they wanted to include. They wrote and issued the contracts. Uh, They worked with, we divided up the authors among the students, and they each had like three or four authors they had to deal with. They copy edited the stuff. They proofread it. They designed the cover. Uh, and the book will come out next July for their graduation. That'll be their graduation present. They get the release of this hardcover and trade paperback book. And, uh, oh, and they, they sent them all out for reviews everywhere. Yeah. And we just, in fact, in this week's issue that lands in your mailbox, uh, we got a starred review in Publishers Weekly for how good a job they had done on the oh album. that's amazing yeah so they it's it's like a tangible thing they work on every aspect of releasing this 
uh, this anthology. And then for their solo project, because that's their group project, their solo project, which in any other degree would be like their thesis paper, uh, they all have to choose some public domain book, like an old Jules Verne book or H.G. Wells book or Alexander Dumas or something like that. They find some long out of print public domain book. And because they have copyright lectures, they have to prove that it is out of copyright. And then they produce that book from start to finish that they find the text, that they proofread it. They, they design the interior, they design the cover, they lay it all out in vellum. They, um, they upload it all on draft to digital. The, the print version goes through Ingram Spark. They're doing tr- hardcovers and trade paperbacks. And it says on the copyright page, edited by whatever their, the student name is. And so when, they're, when they graduate, they have this Monsters, Movies, and Mayhem anthology where they're listed as one of the editors on the title page. And for the reprint classic, they've got their name on the copyright page as edited by. So they've got, uh, they walk out as with credentials in their hands. Uh, and for the year that they're doing stuff, um, we my publishing house is Wordfire Press, and we've got mm-hmm. like 350 titles published and 95 authors, and and they they are interns for our publishing house during the year that they're taking their classes. Uh, so, you know, they they come away with this this MA with what I think is a real understanding of both traditional and indie publishing. Mm-hmm. So. Um, so big plug. We, we start again. Our next group starts in July. Um, it is, um, it starts then it's going to be all online this year. So mm-hmm. that sort of saves you the expense of having to come for two weeks to, to Colorado. Colorado. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, we're, it's just look up Western Colorado university um, and then publishing. And it should, I, I'm sure all of your listeners are, are adept at using Google. Yeah, I, I think um, they probably I, mean, are. I could rattle off the whole log URL and you'll probably put it. Well, in we the can put yeah. that in the show notes. Yes. Um, yes. yes. We will yeah. do but, that. Uh, Great. But where yeah. we are actively looking for students, we filled up last year. We can only take nine in the first cohort and, and we filled up all nine of them. Uh, we've still got some slots open for the next uh, summer. And of course, COVID's making everything uncertain and yeah, nobody knows. But, yeah. but, but it's well, a great time if you're stuck at home to get your yeah, publishing degree, right? That's right. Yeah. And I would just say, if you can go to Colorado for any reason, definitely go. <laughs> I want to go up there. So, so we wanted to ask, too, who would you recommend take this course? Like, who's the perfect candidate? Yes. Yeah. Well, I, to me, I think the perfect candidate is somebody who uh, – wants to make their own like indie publishing house, whether it's just their own books or if they want to edit somebody else's books. Um, Originally, I suppose you could have taken this because you wanted to get to move to Manhattan and get a job as an associate editor at, at Macmillan or something like that. Um, And that's still relevant to what we're doing. Uh, I just don't know that those jobs are going to be the thing you should go to college for anymore. Um, I really think that my ideal student, as in the person that I want to teach, is somebody who is uh, up on indie publishing and wants to um, learn how to do it. And I'm and I'm kind of a stickler on this. I know a lot of indie, relatively successful indie authors and indie publishers who just flat out don't know anything about the publishing industry. They know all about Amazon ads and they know all about uh, Facebook ads and, and newsletter lists and all that stuff, but you know, it, it's if you're going to get become a filmmaker, even an indie filmmaker, you should understand how Hollywood works. Mm-hmm. I, I think that if you're going to be a successful indie author, you really do need to understand um, book distribution, bookstores, because you can't you can't just do it all by yourself. You should understand right. um, how big publishing works and how how to get into bookstores. And this is going to change. I mean, a, a lot of big traditional publishing and big traditional book selling is kind of like blockbuster video. I mean, it, it, you know, it's, it's nice to have a bunch of VHS tape sitting around, but they're not going to help you very much. Right. Uh, but because I just really think you should understand how all aspects of it work. Um, I've seen successful indie authors that have the most abominably bad covers that they design themselves because they think they can do it. Uh, they don't understand typesetting that no two hyphens is not the same as an M dash. And yes. there are other fonts besides times Roman. And, um, 
you know, I, I just, if this is your livelihood, if this is your business, you should really understand how it all works. Right. Very good. That's awesome. So again, we'll put that link in the show notes. So what changes have you seen in your genres over the course of uh, your author career and how have you adapted? And you can pick one. Or sure. Say, oh. Well, and I, I've actually been thinking about this a lot and, and it, it's disappointing to me because what, what I learned how to do and what I do really well is write these big, fat, complicated doorstop Game mm-hmm. of Thrones giant volumes with multiple main characters and all these storylines. Uh, and, you know, a, a book that I would write would be 200,000 words long. Like, that's that's what I would write. And that was my – I love reading those. I love writing those. I get very satisfied writing those. Um, but – in the current marketplace, it's really not driven that way. People don't want one 200,000 word book a year. They want a 50,000 word book every month or two. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and people are wanting to read faster. And those, the stories, when I'm building one of these 200,000 word epics, mm-hmm. I just love this. It's like building a skyscraper. I love the structure of all the storylines that all just builds to this huge climax at the end and the, the payoff is so great. And you can't really do that in 40,000 word chunks. It becomes a weekly TV series instead of uh, an epic movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And weekly TV series are great and they build toward the end of the, of the season as well. And there's usually the cliffhanger or the season finale kind of thing but it's not the same as the end of star Wars. No, it's not that immersion feeling that where you're just in it. Yeah. But if you're indie publishing, I mean, and and at Wordfire press, we've had to reject a a guy who had done this first uh, fantasy novel for us. And then he turned into second one, which was like 220,000 words long. And I said, if I publish this in, we always do in print as well as Mm -hmm. ebook. I said, I'm going to have to put a $45 cover price on this because mm-hmm. it's yeah. just so big. I can't yeah. do this. And you know, that, that discourages me because I like writing the, the big mm-hmm. blockbuster things. But, uh, but on the other hand, um, the, the TV show, the expanse, I really enjoy that. It's mm-hmm. a big science fiction epic mm-hmm. thing. A lot like what I write. Those novels are giant 200,000 word epics, but the weekly TV show really does justice to it, I think. Mm -hmm. And each season of the show is basically one of those big novels. Um, So it can be done, but uh, once I finish some of the big epic contracts that I have for traditional publishing, I would really rethink my next big epic science fiction story and Mm -hmm. try to think of it as, you know, 40,000 word episodes that come out fast rather than um, a gigantic book that comes out once a year. Once a year. Yeah. Yeah. I see that. I see that. I'm a one book a year person and um, I write romance, but you know, I've done well, but it's hard. It's hard. You have to spend a lot of money on advertising to do well. It is easier if you're, if you're putting things out, like at that 50,000. The best advertising is the next book. Absolutely. Absolutely. So yeah, I agree. So what's the best thing you've done to set yourself up for success, do you think? Um, I married properly. My <laughs> well, I mean, it, we, we, kind of, we kind of joke about this. Rebecca and I have been married uh, all, well, a couple more months would be 29 years. Mm-hmm. Um, when we first met, I was kind of this, this dweeby, nerdy science fiction fan that wore a too tight Star Wars t-shirt, and, <laughs> and uh, I thought... I thought by being a, a writer, I could just be eclectic and do whatever I wanted and, and not really pay attention to stuff. But she, she came aboard as sort of the nerd whisperer and uh, she, she kind of recreated. And um, well, we, we kind of compare it to my fair lady and she was my yes. professor Higgins and, yes. and she did the, well, wait a minute, if this is going to be your profession, you got to understand uh, your career. You have to look, look at, uh, uh, becoming a professional and, and you need to stand out. I think what she hammered in is she said, Kevin, you're not just a fan anymore. Mm. And that I have to think about it as a professional. And uh, we really turned around 
making my career decisions uh, with a business basis rather than, oh, I'll, I'll write a dinosaur porn novel next or yes, whatever. Yeah. Although, yeah. Who would have known? Those done very well. For yeah, exactly. Uh, but um, she also, and this was partly because of Star Wars at the time too, but my first bunch of novels, they were sort of like angry young man novels and I had mm-hmm. anti-heroes and I, I went, well, I don't want to be predictable. So I was not doing plot structures the way that that would be expected. And she really kind of um, pushed me into understanding and this was right at the time of of me starting Star Wars, that, wait a second, you actually have to have heroes and you have to have romance and you have Mm -hmm. to have all these crowd pleaser things rather than just the guy's a jerk and he does what he ever, whatever he wants. And then uh, things don't turn out well at the end. I mean, nobody wants to read that. (laughs) that, That's what, that's what college students want to write because they want to do that angry young man stuff. But, uh, but she, but we really learned like I had one of my Star Wars books is called Dark Saber, and it was basically uh, they were trying to set up the great love of Luke Skywalker's life, and and I had it was this huge romance, and you know I was reading science fiction and fantasy. I wasn't really a giant romance person, and in fact I was not all that successful that I could ever get a date for prom in high school and all that stuff. Uh, but when I'm writing this book, Dark Saber, a science fiction Star Wars novel, Dark Saber. I sat back and I spent months reading Gone with the Wind, The Thorn Birds, Somewhere in Time, all these these great classic romances that um you know I never would have thought about reading those before but I understood that that I needed to get a good grip on this so that the the readers would get what they thought that they were paying for. Mm-hmm. So in essence she taught you to right to genre expectations, but keep your own sort of flair about you. Well, and, and also to understand what the reader wants. Yes. I mean, I, I was being sort of like the arrogant writer of, well, I'm going to do what I want and you're going to read whatever I write rather (laughs) than, um, you know, if, if you go in to get a double cheeseburger, you don't want somebody to say, but wait, here's the kale tofu instead. That's what I think you should be eating. (laughs) Uh, it's so much better for you. Yes. Yes. It tastes the same. Yes. No. <laughs> yeah, I know. I tell people, I mean, I always say this, that when a, a new writer comes to me and I, I say, you know, tell me about your book. And they're like, it's like nothing you've ever read. I'm just like, oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. <laughs> it really yeah, needs no. to be a little bit like I, something I've read so that I know I'm going to like it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that is like, awesome. Yeah, it's like that saying, like, they say Hollywood says, give me the same thing, only different, you know? So like you want to meet their expectations, but just put a little something different on it so that they're, they get what they want and they go, Oh, that was really good. It was something new, but not totally new. Yeah, exactly. And clearly you've learned that lesson. You learned that lesson early, Kevin, because well, uh, you've done right, very well. I've applied that throughout. In fact, another thing that she did was, um, this was at the time when the a book called The Bridges of Madison County was oh, the yeah. biggest, oh, yeah. best-selling novel. Huge hit. Yeah. So sad. And, and, and she said, uh, well, you got to read this. And and I have to read, um, uh, what else? The, the Night in the Garden, Midnight in the Garden of Good Oh, yeah. Evil, yeah. And, that was and, and, she, and, and The Da Vinci Code. She said, I said, I don't want to read those books. And she said, those books have sold 29 billion copies, right. they're hitting something. So figure yes. out what it is. And so I kind of grumbled and I sat back and I, I read the bridges of Madison County and went, Oh, I see why. And I can explain for half an hour about exactly what buttons that pushed for people. Yeah. Uh, Midnight, the garden of good, good and evil was a wonderful book. Um, it, it's not the sort of thing that the guy could write 20 of them because mm-hmm. it's a one-off thing. Mm-hmm. Um, Rebecca herself picked up and read Twilight and try to understand, okay, this is why. And she could tell you for 20 minutes exactly why Twilight hit exactly where it did. Um, the the whole Left Behind series, if you remember the, yeah, the yeah. gigantic hits. Um, and so she read the first one of those. Um, personally, like the first couple of chapters are unspeakably bad, but they hit a certain readership that was not being addressed. Um, the Da Vinci Code, 
it's not that great of a book, but I know exactly what he does that is great, that, that the way he puts it all together. And I think, well, here, here's the part of the rant. I don't think that authors should spend their time trashing other authors. No. Like I, I was on a panel once where this, one of my fellow best-selling writers was just ranting on and on about how awful Stephanie Meyer was and how mm -hmm. bad Twilight was as a book. And I went, you know, you're looking at this all wrong that she did something right. So you got to figure out what it is rather right, than right. be grudging her, her success. Right. And, uh, and, yeah. and, you know, my writing isn't the most literary, perfect, beautiful prose in the whole world, but I tell a good story and that's the part that I'm working on. Yeah. Yeah. I, I write romance. And so because of that, you know, people will in the romance community get on Stephanie Myers or E.L. James. And I'm like, listen, guys, it's because of them that we all have a career right now. The ones that started publishing after them, because it opened the floodgates to in romance up to people that had never read romance before. And now they're our readers. And so I want to know what they did to get the kind of readers they had. And I want those readers because, right. and you have to look at it because and, and 12 years later, she's putting out that midnight sun that just kind of went on pre-order this week. It's a retelling of Twilight from Edward's point of view. I, the, my feed has gone crazy over that thing. I mean, everyone, and that's 12 years later that people are that's, still yeah. part of the fandom. And I, that's and, staying power. Yep. Well, you know? and, and always that your fellow writers aren't your competition. I mean, no. it's not a zero sum game no. that, that if, if, a, if the expanse sells lots of science fiction, epic copies, that doesn't take sales away from my science fiction mm -hmm. series. It adds sales to my science right. fiction series exactly. because they can't write as fast as people can read. Exactly. And so when they read one <laughs> of those books, they want to read something else. And, um, and I'm a reader. I want something good to read too. Yeah, and I yeah. get tired of reading my own stuff all day long. So I exactly. want something good to read. In the something evening. different. That's, That's right. right. Well, it's been great having you here. This has just been awesome. Can you tell people how they can find you and, and you know, where's the best Best place to see your stuff? No, well, I'm not giving out my home address. So <laughs> well, you might uh, need some help on the packing those uh, books that you. Well, got I do, I do. I do. I need some help right now if we got that. But um, let's see. Uh, my on my initials are KJA Kevin J Anderson. So uh, on Twitter, I'm the KJA. Um, on Facebook, I'm I think author. Just search for Kevin J Anderson. Yes. Book and I'm the one that's got yeah. the author stuff on it. Uh, my website is wordfire.com, W-O-R-D-F-I-R-E.com. Uh, and actually, we kind of got, we do a regular readers group, a newsletter mm -hmm. sort of thing. And if, at, on wordfire.com, if you sign up, you get a free uh, collection of all of my uh, very funny Dan Shamble zombie PI stories. <laughs> and I also just added uh, one of my short stories I wrote with Neil Peart from Rush, I did an audio book of it. I sat there and read it just like I'm reading it to you at a book signing or something. Yes. And I recorded it and we got a, a, the audio downloaded at, at book funnel. So, so, uh, you know, everybody always says sign up for my newsletter, but if you sign up for my newsletter, you actually do get this cool book and an audio book and a bunch of other stuff. So that's awesome. Uh, that's great. Be a great place to start. And we'll have the link for my uh, publishing master's degree. Yes. If you want to get that and we, and I, I'll encourage it because we, we are open now. We can only take a few, more students. I would love to have some uh, uh, very ambitious indie authors because that way they're going to teach me stuff. Because often yeah. the indie authors, it's such a fast moving thing that that if I don't work constantly trying to keep up on it, that the students are going to know more than I yeah. do. Yeah, so we'll oh, that's true. Exactly. Good motivation. Exactly. Well, we will have the link to that in the show notes and all the links you mentioned. So those will all be easy to find. So thank you so much for joining us. And you can find all of that on wish I'd known for writers.com. Bye everybody. Thank you very Bye. much. Bye. Thanks for listening to the wish I'd known then podcast. We hope this episode inspired you, empowered you and made you laugh a little bit too. If you loved it, tell your friends about it. And if you feel so inclined, leave us a review. We look forward to being with you again next week.